welcome all to the today's Space Dwarf panel discussion. We'll just uh, give it one minute while the numbers rise there. Thanks all for joining. And today's topic is going to be around the future of the workplace and especially the relevance of downtown workplace versus suburban campuses. So it's the Space Door Insights Live 13th webinar, which we launched and have continued throughout this lockdown period and the aftermath, the re rebound. And we'll get going. So for those who have just joined, welcome. This is webinar number 13, role of downtown workplace versus suburban campus. And I'd like to welcome the panel today. And I'll just work across the slide there. Welcome to David and Natalie and Tammy and Arla. And I'll co-moderate with Alex Harvey my colleague. Um, maybe we could just go around in the same order, giving a quick background bio to what we've done and where we've been. Kick off, David. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is David Habern. My background is in community planning and economic development, uh, mainly working with citizens, communities, and companies to uh, imagine everyday status quo spaces into meaningful, vibrant places that people actually want to spend their life in. Uh, I've had the opportunity to study and work in a variety of cities such as Nashville, Tennessee, Cincinnati, Ohio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, New York City, and most recently my role has been as a community manager for WeWork in Kansas City, Missouri, out here in the middle of the country. Uh, as community manager, I worked hand-in-hand -hand with a variety of companies from individual consultants, freelancers, to enterprise-level clients uh, to reimagine re the role of the workplace, uh, what that means for their company, their employee culture, uh, in the pursuit of work-life harmony. Uh, and I just want to be transparent in this conversation. Uh, I've recently entered a garden leave period with WeWork uh, as part of a global reorganization in the company, and my specific position uh, will be eliminated shortly. Uh, so one, some of my thoughts and opinions are not necessarily a reflection of the position of WeWork, and uh, two, I'm actively pursuing a new role. So if you're interested in chatting, uh, I'm happy to connect via LinkedIn after the talk. So looking forward to the conversation, and um, thanks for having me. No, it's great, David, and I trust that this results both in a brilliant <laughs> panel discussion, but also in some new positions offered to you. That's right. Perfect timing. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Natalie Eagles. I am a design principal with Gensler. Uh, before joining Gensler, I um, you know, have a background in interior design from Louisiana State. And I uh, worked in New Orleans, did a lot of hospitality design in Nashville, so crossover with David, um, different times, unfortunately. And then moved to uh, Silicon Valley, where uh, tech became uh, you know, very prominent um, and have been embedded in the tech industry ever since. Um, you know, uh, and, and lead a team uh, with a wonderful colleague, of mine, um, looking across all of our regions, how is tech growing? What is really on the mind of our clients? Um, you know, how are we, um, how are we, you know, projecting into the future? What trends can we start to see? Um, you know, where are people going? And, and helping other industries understand that um, and, and see, you know, what clients are really wanting, um, not only in the Bay Area, but globally for tech. Great. Thanks for joining us, Natalie. Mm -hmm. that, um, it's really a thought leading influence, isn't it, from the, the big techs? Yeah. They've kind of set the trends and set the pace. And Tammy? Yeah, hi. Tammy Kozloff, thanks for having me. Um, I'm the design and innovation lead with Huddle HQ. We started our firm about a year and a half ago. And prior to that, my background's in interior design. And I worked for a global pharmaceutical company in California, headquartered, uh, where as our focus was in real estate, uh, workplace strategy, and programming for the company, we helped uh, implement, develop and implement a uh, workplace strategy that took them from a traditional uh, workplace to a full activity-based workplace. Big move, big transition. Yeah. So, 
great experience. And Allah. Yes, good morning from Southern California. This is where Huddle HQ is. Uh, I, along with Tammy, I am a design and strategy lead for the Huddle HQ. And similarly, uh, that came from the pharmaceutical um, corporate uh, environment. And um, my background is in architecture and lab planning. And now we are passionate about bringing people together in the workplace and uh, creating meaningful interactions. And uh, hopefully it will all come back. And uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Yeah, and as you say, he's going to come back when it's very difficult to say that he's going to come back. But someone said on our last discussion two weeks ago, back to better, which I thought was yeah. a good one. Yes. Yeah, that's good. There is the heart. Yes. Alex, you give us your bio. Yeah, thanks, Nick, and thanks everyone else who's joined us. So my name's Alex Harvey, VP Sales with Space Store. And um, the, the, the role that I have and the perspective that I bring is really in working with our clients globally, um, many of them tech firms, as you've alluded to, Natalie, but many other industries as well. And I think we definitely see the, the influence coming out of tech firms and particularly coming out of Silicon Valley that is, I think every, almost every company we work with globally in some way, shape or form is influenced by some of the, the trends that come out of Silicon Valley. And we're always very keen to, to explore and understand what the challenges are that our clients are, are facing, but also what the opportunities that they're trying to reach out for are and how we can help them with that in their design of their workspaces. Great. And I'm Nick Baxter. So Managing Director in Space Store in the UK region. Our other big region is the US. And my focus or my leaning in between kind of business as usual is what's next. A year or two down the track what's coming what how do we stay relevant and become leading in what's relevant next so a few more have joined while we've been doing the intros um this is the 13th space store insights webinar and the topic specifically today is the the um downtown workplace versus the suburban campus and recognizing the the conflict about getting into big cities so we welcome questions about halfway through. We'll start to pick up questions and bundle similar questions together and attempt to answer as many as we can. We cannot always answer all of them, but we'll reach out to you afterwards. We appreciate all participation. We appreciate any um, recommendations for future panelists as well. So we'll kick off and I'd quite like to um, ask David if you'd lead off because we had a little discussion beforehand about what's what really makes that city that downtown space special and why is it under threat right now in the short term yeah sure so i think well in our in our preliminary conversation i think one of the things that i wanted to raise at least a little bit just to give context to the conversation is perhaps maybe what we mean when we're talking about an urban center versus a, a suburban area right um you know the environment of new york city Rio, London, uh, is going to be a, a very different kind of contextual understanding of what urban suburban divides mean, rather than in Kansas City, Nashville, uh, you know, more less dense uh, cities. So, you know, I think the urban environment, I think what I, well, the way I'm interpreting what we mean by that is, yeah. is a real density of all types of economic and social uh, activities, right? So you, yes, you can think traditionally downtown, everybody kind of understands what we mean when we say that, at least in the American context. But I think, um, you know, when we think of like the, maybe London, I, I'm not as familiar with London, but uh, the role of transportation and, and mass transit is gonna play a much more significant role uh, in the understanding of urban versus suburban there where in Kansas City, a largely car-centric city, um, you know, there's not the same role that transportation plays to get into the center city. Uh, so I think one of the things we'll talk about is, is just more the impact and the role of transportation. Um, but yeah, so there's this division between urban, high density of economic, social, live, work, play dynamics. And then in the suburban context, uh, you may have more, um, separate uses uh, connected by an individualized mode of transportation, call it your own car, maybe a bicycle, um, a bird scooter, who knows what. 
but um, yeah, I thought that was just a, maybe helpful to maybe shape a little bit of when we, when we say urban, suburban, we might, mm, the context of that might mean a little bit different depending on the community that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very helpful to lock that down a bit, define what we mean. I think another part of that is the whole pace of life, is it? Um, certainly the difference between what I've seen just a bit of time in New York as well as London and that's really quite a the whole buzz, the whole um, whether you want to live in the city as well as work there or an hour's commute out, whether that's car or train or whatever. And um, what are your thoughts around that, Natalie? Oh yeah, there's, I mean, with a city, um, there's definitely an energy and a personality. Um, you know, when I left uh, Louisiana with New Orleans, I, it was interesting moving to a different place and trying to find the soul. And, you know, where it's so obvious uh, in New Orleans, um, or it's so obvious in, in these uh, even tighter, smaller communities like you see in, in Europe, um, you have these great, um, their cities or their villages, um, and, but they're, you know, a huge impact on culture. And so trying to find that in other places. And so when you do start to move out to suburban, you know, how can you find a community uh, that can um, that can mimic that energy level. It's really difficult. And so that's where we see a lot of people wanting to move into these city settings uh, because of the offerings and the life and the energy and access to uh, like a varying sorts of, um, of communities. You can layer in aspects of your life. And so when you move out to suburbs, uh, you know, what, what are you gaining? What are you giving up? And so that's a big conversation. And I think for employers, uh, what they're looking at is, you know, they've often moved to where their employees want to be. And so um, if health and safety, if, you know, not going on commuting long distances on trains is going to be a factor, then, you know, they, they may be, you know, looking at uh, either a hub and spoke model, or maybe there is a return um, to a bit of suburban. Natalie, I don't know if you're familiar with this um, article, but one of your colleagues, Nayan Parekh, if I'm pronouncing that right, wrote a really yeah. interesting piece the other day um, on reimagining the future of cities as, as healthy cities. And I, and I really liked how she put it, and, and forgive me, I actually have the article up on my screen here, but was talking about like the, the values of, of urban centers um, being a network of forces that create unpredictability, serendipity, diversity, right? And that's the culture, that energy, that like pulse, you know, you, 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 you step, you land in New York City and there's just an energy, right? There's just mm -hmm. a pulse to a city that is really attractive uh, for a lot of people, especially those that have, have choice in where they live. Um, and we've definitely been seeing that trending more towards people moving into urban centers, San Francisco, mm -hmm. Seattle, Chicago. I mean, I think there's been stats saying that like 75% of the world's population are going to be living in, in urban centers by like, you know, 2030. I don't I forget exactly what the stat is, but you know what I'm saying. Plus that, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, it's a really interesting time now where a lot of those individual pieces that make up that energy, mm -hmm. um, you know, restaurants and, and museums and, and the cultural amenities that are, are also part of the lifestyle component of, of living in a city, you know, really have some strong challenges um, in, you know, a lot of them are closed right now. And, you know, there's a lot of questions about when those will reopen. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of employees are at least... Um, trying to consider what is that what is the value that I'm getting from you know living in a dense urban area where a lot of the the val what was valuable is now somewhat a threat <laughs> yeah yeah so everybody's having to go through this kind of risk benefit analysis um yeah. to, to determine how they're going to engage with the world Mm -hmm. I think it's just a moment in the history, though, right, that we are, unfortunately, we are all part of. And, and uh, as much as it is striking and difficult and, you know, we have to make drastic choices. So obviously, one of them being working from home, uh, the, the drive towards uh, the density, the collision with others uh, from both employer and employee perspective will go back to more. Uh, perhaps more centralized model with a downtown base. 
and why because again i want to just talk a little bit more about that uh, and and you mentioned that they've just a little bit it's uh, yes it's an access to uh, you know fun and cultural enrichment but it's also you know on both ends uh, especially from the employer perspective it's an access to the talent and the diversity of it and the variety of it uh, but also when you are at that talent, you are inspired by presence of other talented people very close by where it is impossible to really recreate in the suburban model because you live in a very comfortable home with a very comfortable yard. But to anybody else, it's a little bit further and you don't have this sense of pressure in a healthy way uh, of, of being creative and then being inspired pretty much at every turn of your walk. So mm -hmm. just needing very, to be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we can speak from that um, only because we are pretty much 50 miles out of LA. So yes. and that, this is where we reside. We've experienced it on a grander scale at this point. I mean, it's, it's like you're on an island during this time right now. I um, personally, you know, you had to kind of readjust all of your daily activities. And then, like Alla said, finding that inspiration, you know, within my four walls of this home, it's, it's really boring. So, you know, you're just, you're just dying for that human connection. You want to get out, you want to see people. And it's, I mean, I'm, I know many people are feeling the same way, whether you're in the city or the suburbia, but um, being out in the suburban area, it's, it's isolated for sure. Yeah, it's true. You know, we've seen, I mean, that was one of the uh, feedbacks on a work from home study that we um, did and came out with the results yeah. just recently was that, you know, um, people want to go back to the office. It was a 70% and mm -hmm. Um, which you know, to me was shocking because um, I thought, oh, okay, people are going to have access to working from home. They're going to love this. But when you look at not just the parents um, uh, and millennials um, who are having a hard time focusing, but the people who, you know, it, they are in small spaces and they need to get out. They want to be around people. Sometimes it's their access to daylight and, and vistas beyond the building next door. So um, it's, that's a really interesting aspect that I don't think people took into account uh, when we first started this. Yeah, so I mentioned, yeah. so I'm really interested in those statistics. So like 70%, right? That's a very high number that would show like yeah. a large proportion of people desire to come back to work. Uh, and I'm also going to assume that in that there's maybe a, uh, an urban setting in that, right? Um, but I think there's an interesting concept that a lot of uh, downtown districts, at least in the, in the middle of the United States, consider like when you're trying to redevelop an urban area, clean mm -hmm. and safe, right? That's a, mm -hmm. Those are two words mm -hmm. that are often discussed in conjunction uh, yeah. to make an area inviting, right? And so in the midst of a global health crisis where there is this virus that people, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of more information coming out every day about what it is, how you, how it's contracted, mm -hmm. all those sort of, it also contributes to a lot of real or perceived fear about yeah. engaging in the world in the ways that sure. we are accustomed to, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that I've, I've talked about in other uh, parts of my career is like the legibility of engaging in an environment, right? You don't want to have to think too much, right? You just want to be able to engage in the environments that you're interacting with uh, and you read certain signals in a way that says, okay, this makes sense to me and I can go about my life in a normal way. In our minds, everything is turned upside down right now, right? And so there is a strong pull of those natural intuitions of connections with other people, uh, socializing, um, uh, those those fifteen minute breaks that you have in the day, right? Like when I'm when I'm when I stop doing my work and I have ten minutes before I actually have to jump into another meeting, what am I going to go do? Am I going to go get a, a cup of coffee down on Fifth Avenue? Uh, am I going to take a walk around the block? Am I going to have a, a water cooler conversation with somebody else in the office, right? Those things are also fulfilling to the overall experience that have, one has in life. But right now, that is also fraught with a concern of, is that safe to do? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if we could just pick up just quickly on what you described, Natalie, as a hub and spoke model, just so we're understanding all of us and all the audience. Oh, sure. What's envisioned by that? Yeah, definitely. You know, we're hearing an interest um, for a resurgence in this conversation. This did happen years ago, um, and uh, and it went away a bit. Now it seems to be back. Where there, you know, maybe your headquarters, if you are in an 
um, city in, in a, this urban setting, it becomes more of a destination. Um, there are uh, moments that you need to go in, you want to go in, there's a larger context or effort that's happening there. Um, and, and maybe even a dose or a grounding in that uh, old, like the mega culture yeah. of companies. And then having a spoke model that's closer to where people are living. There could be lots of them because you could keep the teams um, oriented or you could keep you know the settings uh, much smaller um, so that people aren't having to go onto um, uh, mass transportation every day of the week. Um, or even, you know, multiple times, but having, so those would become your spokes, um, where that's your, uh, you know, more constant interaction. And what would you think, and David also, because you're out of WeWork, well, what do you think about a, a hub and hub model where you, you don't just have a little piece of the company, but you have a campus for co-working? Because yeah, I think I, there's I think serious a investment, isn't there, in that, that suburban piece needs investment, and will that be happening in the near term? Well, yeah, I think the, the opportunity for uh, companies to fairly on demand have, have a network or an ecosystem of workspaces that, that their employees can have access to um, is a really valuable solution in this. Um, you know, maybe that's going to be certain parts in an urban setting and it might be certain parts in a, in a more suburbanized setting. Um, you know, I'm also thinking of like the role of just small districts throughout a city, right? Like Maybe not everything is concentrated around like the central business district, right. uh, but you have, you know, uh, I think you have to think more broadly about like the 24 hour cycle of, of somebody's day. And, uh, you know, what are the things that could potentially be done from a, a home environment? What are the things that could be done from a more like semi public, semi private environment, like a co working space or even like a, a library or, or a coffee shop? And then what are the things that really have to happen? in a more corporate setting where you have the team together coming together. So as Natalie's saying, I think you have to, to think about those um, kind of business cases for the activity that you're trying to do. And then, yeah, having a, a, an ecosystem or, or a network of spaces available to you uh, in both urban and suburban settings, uh, I think could be really valuable. So call it co-working, call it spec office, um, you know, where the company doesn't have to take a lot of time and investment to set up operations, uh, they can more easily access that, I think is going to be a valuable solution to this. I'd be interested to see how that, how that works in addressing some of the challenges that we see emerging from the, the work from home experiment in that people are saying, I, I want connection with people, I want connection with, with um, often my tribe, that the people that I'm working closely with, which uh, a kind of hub and spoke model could end up being almost you're going into a workplace full of unknown people. Yes, they're employees who work for the same organization as you, but are they your tribe? Are they the people you actually work with and that you have those connections with and maybe you want to have those um, collaboration moments with, or are they just, you know, is it, is it equivalent to walking into a coffee shop? Mm. Oh, well, it could be. I mean, um, the big thing with this though is we are seeing technology as a huge accelerator in this moment. And, uh, you know, we are going to need to create uh, uh, very mixed reality workspaces, conference rooms, um, areas where, um, you know, it doesn't, um, because we have been working from home and we have now created this equal experience amongst all of us, uh, there is a huge ask from humans to continue that as we go back to our workplaces and so, or our offices, if you will. And so, you know, how are we going to be able to create this equity of experience for people who are virtual, um, even if they're in another office? It doesn't have to be that they're in uh, their home. Uh, it could be that they're in their home, but, you know, we, we need to be able to have this mixed uh, reality uh, of virtual and um, in place. And what about you up a, an interesting reality? Sorry, Nick, just real quick on that point. Right. The, the idea of, of, you know, being alone together in a space, right? Like yeah. that is a very real reality that, um, you know, as a community manager at WeWork, I, I somewhat saw every day where somewhat my role was to be icebreaker for people, right? Mm -hmm. Have conversations, introduce, make connections um, because as, as adults, you're not always, you know, so willing to just go break the ice with somebody that happens to be in the same space as you, right? So I think in the idea of, of co-working and, you know, the idea of community is, is thrown around a lot. Um, ways to actually engage and, and digital uh, invitations might be a part of that. Um, 
but yeah, I think that the thirst for human connection is not just to be kind of alone together. It is to yeah. actually have dialogue and engagement. Uh, so to the point of like, who's yeah. your tribe or is it just people that happen to be in the same room as you? I think is an interesting um, awareness. Yeah. And for introverts, I think it is alone together. I mean, because that is, that is their interaction and that's okay. I wonder, Arla, do you have any thoughts around that? The um, what's coming in a kind of hybrid Zoom and office world, and those challenges yeah. around equity, it's, digital equity. I, I completely understand and and believe that technology is going to continue uh, enhance our uh, relationships, uh, enhance our experiences of working with the distributed team. Uh, however, I, I cannot see it ever coming in the first place before the direct interaction and real connection in person. So th this is, uh, and, and it could be uh, my generational understanding of what true uh, in interaction means, but um, nevertheless, uh, I, I believe that there's nothing that takes away from, uh, you know, kind of being together in the same room and, and experiencing, uh, uh, you know, each other, you know, as a team, as a group, as individuals individuals, the dialogue, the, the conversation, even hearing somebody else talking about something else, being exposed to other ideas. It's never the same as watching TV. I'm sorry, right? So even if we come up with a fantastic uh, technological enhancement that might take us to you know, to, to, to better relations via, via screen or via, uh, you know, an image of somebody that is digital in front of me. Um, I, ho hopefully the young ones, you know, will, will take, uh, take it much more naturally. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but for me, I'll definitely miss the sense of human next to me too, you know, so uh, the, uh, it will, I, I'm looking forward, obviously we all saw how we all broke the barrier of Zoom in last, uh, you know, months uh, before <laughs> you, we only saw usually the image, right, of a person that was talking to us because people were camera shy and now we just don't care, frankly, right? I mean, we are so, we became so comfortable because everybody else is at home and everybody else has a bad light and everybody else you know has just kind of issues of the kids passing by or spouses interrupting or the loud neighbor or you know whatever else so I think that comfort you know built our experiences to the next level and perhaps prepares us to be ready for um I don't know, hologram image of somebody mm -hmm. growing in front of me and talking. And I am so looking forward to that. And we, we talked about it, you know, years ago uh, when uh, we were building the welcome center for our company in the past and, and how this technology is going to um, augment our uh, relations. You know, that's fascinating and interesting. But but, you know, this little but, you know, I am starving for um, denser conversation in person without uh, social distancing, masking and, uh, you know, all of, all of those aspects that we have to do and we are doing it uh, for the best reasons possible for our safety. But idea of going back uh, to the office that even is close by, but I am shy. Um, for health reason to approach my colleague uh, that is wearing a mask, it's horrifying uh, to me as well, right? So uh, the tensions uh, are present, I think, and, and uh, valid. Um, I am looking forward for the next step, which would be that we are no longer afraid of each other. And um, that is something that will hopefully not only bring us back to the normal that we know and understand from the past, but it will create a new normal in the better way, right? Um, we will be more conscious of, the, of our wellness, of our health, and also the employee, employee, employees and employers will be more aware of that. So again, those environments that will be building our experience of the day will be more focused on the health, well-being, and uh, not only physical, but mental, because we are all coming out a little bit crazy out of that. Uh, so in the next year or so, you know, who knows how bad it's going to be for us uh, when uh, staying in the isolation. And, uh, and that's what I'm looking forward, that uh, hopefully we will not lose uh, the opportunity to learn and apply those learnings in better version of the workplace. 
and um, just again, I think that we all want to be part of that. I think that's what we're all looking forward to, isn't it? The, what's going to be the, the improvement through this thing? Um, I think there's going to be some incredible resilience, uh, I think, of the, hum of the human spirit, right? Like, at, a, at its core, we are social beings, right? Whether you're extroverted or introverted. And I think a lot of habituation about how humans naturally interact with each other, all I couldn't agree mm -hmm. with you more, there's nothing that fully replaces full human to human, all of the nonverbals, all of the experiential connections that come from being in the same physical space with someone. Um, so I don't think it'll digital tools will ever fully replace, but I think they will supplement. And I yeah. think that will be an interesting uh, new normal, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the, the experience, you know, I, I'm sure you all remember like when you would just pick up the phone and talk to somebody, you didn't have like this pre-planned text. Can I call you at this time? And no, I'm busy. Yeah. And like, like, you just do it. And I, so I think the ways we adapt to using the digital tools of today will also need to evolve uh, to, to full, more fully supplement um, the short term reality. But then I think in, in the long term, uh, a lot of the trends that we were experiencing prior to this time, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of them will come back. They may look somewhat different, um, but I think just as human beings, we're drawn to each other. We want to be in, in, in physical proximity to one another. Uh, we do, and, and it's, it's that playoff, isn't it? It's that gravity between wanting to be um, back with the tribe, back with people, colleagues, co-workers, versus the real risks. And the, in addition to the real risks, which are very real in different areas, of course, they're differing, but psychologically, the fears. Um, and that's a real thing to get over, isn't it? Even when the risk is down, mm -hmm. to emerge from where we've been. Um, some questions coming in and we welcome all questions but there's one that um, the whole conversation is based on the assumption the virus is here forever. Well I don't quite think it is but we're recognising that there's an enduring effect from it um, and how do we see the workplace evolving post a vaccine? Um, how would, tell me, how would you like to pick up on that one? Sure, I mean Right now, who's to say, right? We really don't have all of the answers because we're not in that state yet. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of investment that corporations have gone through to get where they are now. Yeah. So they're going to be looking at it from a bottom line perspective. And even though the safety of their staff is going to be um, probably at the foremost of their thoughts, they will have to balance that with what they can truly afford to do. So it may, you may see some companies coming at it a very minimal approach and taking some um, small modifications to their space. Whereas other corporations, because they, ha they can, they have the means, they'll, they'll put everything, all the, the latest, the new technologies and everything that they can into the space to um, make it better and, um, more inviting for their staff to come back. They want to build that confidence. Everybody wants to build the confidence in, the, in their people. What we were saying it speaks to something that, that Natalie said earlier, which I was, I was wanted to pick up on, was how can we create the workplaces that people want to come back to mm -hmm. instead of yeah. them being told you have to come back? I, we, we talked to a lot of our clients. I was speaking to one of our, um, our clients in North America yesterday who were saying we've got 25% of our people back. They're the people who felt comfortable. We're not enforcing it on anybody. Mm -hmm. And 25% is an interesting number. I don't know whether that's higher or lower than I was expecting to hear, but creating the workspaces that people want to come to, Natalie, I guess is, is a big part of, of your thought process, but can you share something about around that? Oh, definitely. Um, I, you know, I mean, Tammy is exactly right. Like it's, uh, there's a lot of investment that has been made and, um, I, you know, there's an aspect that I'm starting to see bubble up across the world um, and I'm, that I'm thrilled about, and it's one of healthy habits. Um, you know, we, um, we had gone from a moment, I have this wonderful colleague, Kelly Dubasar, who um, talks about how we had moved from a we moment years ago. You know, we all remember when it was very me focused and then we went to a we, and now we're moving into this collective or mega we, uh, where we are actually operating um, with you in mind, 
and you know each other and so everything that i do has a direct effect on you uh, in some way we're realizing mm -hmm. that you know we are much more connected uh, physically um, than we thought because of this virus and so no the virus won't be around forever hopefully let's all cross your fingers or knock on wood whatever is nearby um but um you know it has brought this attention um to one another and an appreciation for you know um you know what one does another one is affected and so with that uh, we had started to move away from um personalization not so much in the photo on your desk but also in where do you wash your hands where do you put your items? Is Are your bags sitting on a floor? Are your bags sitting um, like under your desk? Is it where people have walked? Is it, you know what I mean? Like how clean are things? And so can we start to really look at uh, bringing healthy habits or um, new rituals for some cultures, old rituals for others, uh, bring that more to the forefront and expose that um, in a way that, um, you know, lets people know I'm doing this I am doing this for me and I'm doing this for you. I think that's a very good um, positive outcome, possible positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we will see that, Natalie, that this sense of the social responsibility will become part of our just, you know, norm. And that's, uh, that, would be, that would be fantastic to, to see it grow. Yeah. One hopes. I'm a little bit more bullish on, on human nature on that, maybe. Uh, you know, I, I, I do want to have, have hope that we can all kind of uh, recognize the social responsibility that you know, we, have, we have in this. But I also see that you know, as a challenge in giving people trust and confidence in the environments that they're going to experience either in route to their uh, workplace or even in the workplace themselves. Um, and so I think creating, creating places that people want to come to ultimately does come down to trust and confidence between mm -hmm. the self and the, the environment in which they're going. So I think mm -hmm. there's, there's steps, in, and I know WeWork has done this quite a lot, um, to, to really try to put as many guidelines in place uh, around social behaviors, around um, you know, so distancing, like all of the things that a lot of the public health organizations are recommending, trying to put those into place. But then it falls onto the individual to to abide, right? right. And, and will that happen? I mean, mm -hmm. that's a question. Well, I mean, we're seeing it in communities where people are yeah. refusing, even though it's mandated to wear a mask. You know, we're, we're seeing this issue, you know, if, where people feel like a right has been taken away um, and versus that um, it's for their own good and it's for the good of the people around them. It's, it's really, it's screaming a very strong change management program for oh, yeah. a lot companies, you know, talking about it, leading, you know, leading by example, having your managers really support and infuse that in their own staff. I and mean, we saw that moving from a traditional workplace to an activity-based workplace. It took a significant change management program to get people comfortable talking about behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. of their colleagues. They, a lot of people just want to ignore and, you know, I, I didn't see that. I don't want to pretend like it, I just want to pretend like it didn't happen. But, you know, it's just, it's just you know, make it normalized and have a conversation around it. And um, like you said, Ola, have that self-awareness and those social aspects brought more prevalent. Yes, really excellent point on change management. I also think that we're going to need to, um, a lot of companies are talking about their sick policies and how strict um, they're gonna be, if you're sick, don't come in. We know you can work from home. Um, however, it's, um, we've seen this time and time again, if a manager um, puts pressure on people to be in the office, it's gonna be really difficult. Um, and so that change management is gonna need to go across, um, across all levels. You know, if a company is saying that this is okay, it needs to be okay. Um, because I mean, everybody went in sick. Um, it, oh, it's yep. just a little cold. Oh, it's a little sniffle. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was all the time and we just, uh, we're going to need to move away from that one. Um, I have a question about what are we feeling or missing the most about um, the office, the workplace, ourselves, but I'd also like to extend that to our clients. What are you hearing, Natalie, from clients? What are you actually doing now and saying now? Oh, there, uh, uh, most 
people are just are missing each other. Um, there is a huge aspect of culture, you know. I mean, I think that's what's so fascinating. Um, it's something that I miss desperately, um, just within Ginsler. You know, I mean, like I loved seeing my colleagues in person. Um, you know, there's a uh, we're very much a family, and so mm -hmm. that aspect I miss. Um, I, uh, I'm hearing the same thing from clients and the other thing that they're missing is while they feel like they're, um, or I'm starting to hear they're, they're moving forward, um, in a very steady way. Are they innovating? Are they sharing ideas? Are they bumping into people they wouldn't have bumped into? Um, so back mm -hmm. to yeah. some of the points we heard earlier, you know, there, uh, there is, a um, a miss for that. And then just being able to, I know this is, uh, like, uh, kind of funny, but just being able to like go out to lunch or walk somewhere besides around your block. Um, mm -hmm. Like I'm kind of tired of walking the same direction around my block. So like, okay, well maybe I'll venture out the other way, you know? And so it's like, just, yeah, you know, but like <laughs> that our lives have come to that, you know? Yeah. So there's variety. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. And, um, and just changing up your day, like letting it be different and not the same. And, and extending that a bit further, how close do you think clients are if you just took a, a spread of your corporate clients or your tech clients how close are they to the planning the new the new normal mm -hmm. the reimagined um state of things for their workplace i think um it, it's varying you know uh we have one amazing client that uh, adobe that said uh, you know we don't want to be first we want to be right and, um, and so for them, you know, they're taking a very conservative approach. Like, let's wait and see, you know, how long is this going to last? Is it, is it getting worse? What are the, uh, the true effects that we can start to see coming out? And then we have others who, um, you know, uh, are hearing from their employees that they need to go in. And uh, so they're doing smaller, uh, smaller fixes. A lot of people are interested in um, this kind of mudroom concept where you can have your lockers, you can leave what you traveled with, hand sanitizer, hand washing, and then you get your work yeah. items. Do you have your own mark um, uh, markers? Do you have your own post-its? Do you have your own coffee mug? And um, and that's how you operate. And that's your work gear. You leave your work gear, you get your um, home gear as you uh, travel back. So um, we're starting to hear a lot of um, you know, a lot of people are beginning to explore the conference room setup is the one that everyone is diving into. Um, you know, how are we going to solve that? Um, so that's, there's a lot of conversation. Oh, and then we have some people who think it's all going to go back to normal. Yeah. Uh, uh, completely. And then we have some who are like, we were only going to meet um, in the office. It's just going to be about meetings. We won't do task work there. So um, because we're studying these two completely opposite things with some clients. Um, it's pretty fascinating to see, you know, probably be somewhere in the middle. It's an interesting uh, topic, just like the role of the culture of the company uh, yeah. in, in, in some of these decisions, right? Um, you know, there are, there are, there are cultures of, of companies that are, are naturally drawn to you know, highly serendipitous, dynamic urban environments. Um, and then there's some companies that are somewhat inherently drawn to perhaps more conservative, stable, uh, less dynamic environments, and how that also, you know, trickles down to the experience of the employee. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, I, ho I hope that an outcome of this uh, is the enablement of, of choice uh, for an employee of where, where to do, where to, to do, do their work, uh, but there also presumes an, an enormous amount of trust between employee and employer uh, to have free range of choice. I think, you know, Twitter was, you know, cut, came out where they, I think they announced something that uh, was interpreted as they can work from home from ever. Mm -hmm. But I think it was misunderstood that it's really the person has the choice, you know, so they're, they're not giving up necessarily offices. They're not, they're not closing. They're not like abandoning office. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just a greater level of choice in where the employee is going to do their work. That was an interesting thing that you brought up earlier about, um, you know, and we had heard this, I believe, from Facebook that said, um, you know, if you want to live anywhere, well, you know, your salary will go accordingly, but you can move uh, where you want. Um, and that, I think, plays a big part of the conversation on, you know, do you stay in um, cities or, or people moving out to uh, more urban areas? 
you know? Yeah, certainly. If, if, a, if a company can accommodate it, right? I mean, generally it's going to be larger companies. I mean, now we were talking about this in our preamble. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, might employees choose to, to relocate metropolitan areas altogether? Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and might a, you know, first ring suburb of Kansas City, let's say, uh, where I currently live, but potentially be able to be connected to a company that's based in San Francisco or in New York um, and, the, and the, the cost of living changes um, and where they may not, if they choose to move out of the city, they may not move to just the suburban area of that city. Now, mm-hmm. there might be reasons to do so just for a few other uh, cultural, economic opportunity reasons, but there may also be opportunities to uh, to relocate altogether. Yes. Mm-hmm. One thing that we talked about though with that um, was like two sides of the coin was one, <laughs> you could move somewhere and then and then your career is stuck because there's not another opportunity or another employer that you know take you um, because you live. Um, out somewhere. I don't want to pick on a certain city, so I'm not going to say well, because um, then you'll get a lot of um, comments about my choice in uh, teasing a city. But anyhow, uh, the other aspect, though, that is really interesting to me on this is diversity. Um, for so long, we have been looking for diverse candidates, um, and this is across tech, this is across our own industry, and we've been asking them to move to where you know we mm-hmm. live. So, you know, really looking into uh, these amazingly uh, rich culture cities and asking someone to come to a city that's completely different. And oftentimes, on the, on the individuals that we're looking at, you know, you don't have the cultural base. Uh, you don't have people that look like them. You don't have um, the, the aspects, whether it's food, it's church, it's, you know, a lot of their foundational um, aspects of life. Uh, in the city that you're asking them to come. And so it's really difficult. So now with the idea that we could be, um, you know, more uh, uh, spread apart and where we actually work, you know, could we start to recruit, um, you know, these, this mindset that we're searching for, this, um, you know, different point of view and, and not make them relocate from the culture that makes them exactly what we're looking for, um, and let them uh, participate that way. I, I think that could be a huge uh, benefit or add, um, you know, that, that hasn't really been working out uh, in the past, specifically when we get to diversity. Brings a whole and new that meaning. could go vice versa too. I mean, that could be a small town looking for diversity, um, uh, or it could be, you know, and it's not just uh, race, it's, you know, it's all aspects of diversity, so, yeah. Sorry, Alex, you're going to say something. I was just going to say it brings a whole new meaning to, to the phrase we've all heard that, that work is what you do, it's not where you go. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 almost the global aspect you're, you're referring to there where you could work for an organization potentially halfway around the world if, if the time zones would permit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I think that that is the one, you know, at first we thought, okay, it's a financial, everybody wants to move out, get this, you know, giant yard, have a farm, um, but work for a company in New York. Um, and that's how we were all taking it. Um, but at the same time, I think we could look at it um, from a, you know, can we look for um, not just the same candidates from, you know, even high-end schools. Could we look for um, candidates uh, from really diverse cultures um, and, you know, these amazing backgrounds and have them enrich our cultures regardless of where they're living? And Arla, what are you hearing from clients? What are they saying and how's the how's the work from home or the hybrid thing going and what are you hearing? The patience is present, obviously, just like Natalie mentioned. Uh, there is no um, jump, jumping outliers really uh, among people and organizations that we work with. They are more um, trying to welcome people back when that time comes mm-hmm. and make them feel safe, comfortable, uh, without dramatic shift of the environment that they already invested in. Yeah. So yeah. it is, uh, some of the choices are a, a little, you know, difficult for us to swallow in a way because they come from, um, again, perception of safety and security to some degree. and. Then, Sometimes they take away from the 
best that this environment used to offer like openness and you know again the, a, a density that uh, we like in certain environments because again of all the good stuff that it brings um, so so you know again uh, being prepared short term I hope it means something different than uh, thinking about long-term strategy of the shift to some degree of the workplace how it operates how it feels and how it welcomes us in the again in the future when we are already um, a little bit more armed better armed to deal with COVID. Uh, it's, for now uh, again uh, the distancing social distancing and and uh, safety and security measure of wearing masks you know those are the just the typical and standard elements and um, again we don't see um, that unless you absolutely have to go to the office you just don't go because you know um, there's the experience of your workplace right now it's heavily compromised and and um, unless you are for whatever reason you have to be uh, six feet from your colleague you know you just don't go uh, but but in the long run again uh, the, the the thinking uh, i think will eventually um, and it is already seeded but uh, you know what what would it mean long term uh, for the for the organization to offer the place that attracts why do i want to go back to the office what drives me there it's again it's other people it has is the first answer and if they are not there you know um I, why would I make the choice of going? And everything that comes with the design of the space that makes me feel comfortable and, and welcome. And again, uh, we talked a little bit about the well-being aspects of, of uh, humans and, and social you know, responsibilities of uh, making sure that my actions affect in a positive your health. You know, this is all going to play a little bit, definitely stronger role long term. But you know, we don't, we, none of us have the uh, defined answer and prescription of how the space will look like and what's the best version of it. I, I predict that it's going to be just like it was before in a way of that it will fit your specific organization in the unique way and you will shape it in the way that it fits your business and your culture that, you know, are extremely important here uh, and as far as the you know shape of the desk and and uh, you know private office versus you know uh, activity based workplace you know all of that is going to evolve and realistically specific it will react to what you need as a as a business owner and what your culture wants to demonstrate so Again, bringing people and attracting people back to the office, it's not going to be an easy task in the long run. And uh, the companies that can make those steps to enhance their environment, I hope they will do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I, um, I saw one of the questions on here, like, why this is going to go away. Why would we do these changes? And, or, you know, why, uh, why would we need to go through this? Um, just like the, you know, Black Plague, uh, the question was, it went away. But, you know, um, we had started, um, it had shifted, there were two things that were happening. Um, the price per head, uh, basically, in, uh, for real estate and, uh, and what that meant over time. And so it started um, getting tighter and tighter and tighter. As amenities grew, workspace got tighter. But there wasn't a desire or, um, and change management aspect for um, hotel, what we used to call hoteling or free address. And so, you know, if we can get back, uh, it, you know, some of the some of the aspects are great, and we're going to need to keep that. And that, depending on company, it is part of the culture. Um, but in that open space, uh, there is an aspect that we're going to need to look at. You know, only in a, on a good day, there were sixty percent of people going into the office. And so, exactly. you know, can we embrace that? Um, and and yes, maybe um, it does increase your, you know, price. Um, per employee, um, just in the uh, uh, you know square foot per person, it's only going up a little. It's just making it a little bit a little bit more room, uh, just to be spread apart. It's looking at some of the infrastructural aspects. You know, your rent, rent for, your rentable square footage um, price might go up a little bit just because of some of the things in the building, infrastructure, um, mechanical, elevatoring, restrooms. At the same time. 
I think we need to be mindful that you know, there's a huge, another um, thing that Tammy was saying about change management, getting into free address and how, you know, people that want to come in one to three days, that grouping, they're going to need to be in hoteling. So how are you going to, you know, put that into your program? And I think that's something that we will need to address. It's going to change um, going forward. Yeah, and that's connected to all of that that you just said, Natalie, oh, plus different technology tools, right? So mm -hmm. if I yeah. need to or want to reserve the seat or, you know, check uh, how many people are right now in the office mm -hmm. and do I feel good about it right now? And, uh, you know, I think that uh, this is the... Uh, perhaps the fastest uh, opportunity, right? The interaction with the new uh, technology, I call them toys, and but they're very yeah. useful. So looking forward to that. One question, Natalie, on the, uh, I, I definitely see that kind of blended work model emerging as, as a, a strong favorite for many clients. You know, you'll be at, working at your home, whatever it is, workstation, uh, some of the time, and you'll be in your, in your workplace some of the time. We've seen a huge amount of design input go into making workplaces the best they can be in terms of employee productivity. Mm -hmm. But have you seen any clients putting thought into, well, what does, what does the work from home bit of that look like? Do, do we need to actually des to put design input into that so that people can be as productive as they can be on those in-between days? Yes, I think that conversation is starting to come out and it's fascinating to me because at first, um, you know, a lot of companies are saying, oh, we're going to save money on real estate. However, they now have, you know, 6,000 other bits of real estate in the yes. home. And so, you know, there's going to be a, um, this um, other aspect. I was just talking to a group of CFOs um, where we, we discussed this, where, you know, uh, real estate costs is going to shift a bit. Yes, some is going to be in a corporate setting, and then some is going to need to go back into the home setting. And how are we really looking at that? Um, I mean, I sat on a dining room chair for the first uh, two months, and I was like, oh my gosh, at this age, I can't do that. My hip was killing me. So, you know, I mean, like there is something to ergonomics. We've got to be mindful of how we're setting ourselves up, and, um, and companies are um, definitely supporting that. So it's just, uh, it's going to need to be factored into how it works. A lot of, a lot of companies didn't have a work, a true work from home mm -hmm. policy uh, and that enabled a setup. Some did um, and some didn't. So uh, that's going to be an aspect to look at. Yes. I also think there's an interesting role that, that technology will play a la to the previous points that we were discussing about, you know, mm -hmm. the, maybe not replacement, but supplementation. I think some of the, the digital collaboration companies, Zoom, Slack, you name it, you know, are really going to have some pressure to try to create uh, tools or features that have more of a perpetual uh, engagement rather than this kind of peer-to-peer -peer scheduled, um, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. connection. Uh, Facebook portal comes to mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just from just kind of the, the serendipitous kind of hey side conversation type yes. of things that you can, you can have in an office. But then I think the other thing uh, just from culture in a work from home setting is companies really have to be more intentional about the social dynamics, right? Like, um, you know, having social meetings where the purpose is not to discuss anything business, but is to just yeah. kick back half a glass of Merlot, have your craft beer, you know, whatever yeah. it may be, like just have those social engagements where you're, you're not focusing on work, but you're able to bring people together to, to continue building those relationships. Right. I mean, can you imagine being a new hire right now, trying to adapt to your culture of your business? That would be really difficult to do at this yeah. point, you need those really. social aspects. I think that's, that's where the, that, w w when you said about the mega we concept, Natalie, that, that encapsulated exactly what I was thinking, um, mm -hmm. but that, that encaptured it very well. The, the, um, the, the ben beneficial aspect to everybody, particularly maybe those new hires, because I may not need to come into the workplace for my own sake, but, but I may be able to make their life a lot easier by doing so and by engaging them with the culture. So yeah. fantastic point. I really appreciate that. Um, we're now at our time, so I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the conversation there. So thanks everyone for joining us. We were just going to launch a, a quick poll now, um, if, the, if Amanda could, could launch that, just to invite you to continue this conversation in a, a more of a private roundtable environment next week. So again, thanks so much to all of our panellists. Thanks to David and Arla and Tammy and Natalie for joining us. It's been a, a great conversation, very, very inspiring and insightful. And thanks too to everyone who's attended. We appreciate you taking your time to, to listen to the thoughts and insights. And hopefully you've been 
inspired and learned something because I certainly have. Thanks all and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Bye.